You cannot say you love somebody and treat them poorly. They do not love you if they treat you poorly. And you are under zero obligations to love them just because they are quote-unquote family. We're going to read Too Soon Old, Too Late Smart. Six pages. We're on chapter two. So this is the chapter I was speed reading um, when I had just moved to Albuquerque. I was trying to read a book a day. A book a day. And then I got this book because it was recommended on a podcast. And um, number two, chapter two is what made me stop. I said, I can't speed read through this because this is like amazing writing. It is incredibly insightful. There is no fluff to this. This is literally a 150 page book and no words are I mean, wasted. So let's read chapter number two. We are what we do. People often come to me asking for medication. He's a psychologist, psychiatrist. They are tired of their sad mood, fatigue, and loss of interest in things that previously gave them pleasure. Oh, by the way, yesterday's chapter, the, uh, you know, the map, uh, if the ground doesn't match the map, the map is wrong. If the map doesn't match the ground, the map is wrong. And then you were supposed to think about were there things in your life where yesterday, did y'all notice anything where something was off? You had a certain expectation, it didn't happen, your environment, like you think, you know, you think you're a kind, giving person, but you snap at your husband or your friend or you fly off the handle. But you realize like, I'm short tempered. Well, that's not being kind. Like some people think it's okay to, to say that they're short tempered, but they still think they're a good kind person. I'm like, no, those are opposites. <laughs> That's the opposite. So, you know, did you guys find anything in your life where the, the map in your head did not match the ground? The people, the relationships, the things y'all did. Come here, you sack of taters. Just started. You guys ready for some cuteness overload? Look at cuteness overload. <laughs> Loving, easy, baby. I make for a pretty girl. They are tired of their sad mood, fatigue, and loss of interest in things that previously gave them pleasure. That's classic signs of depression. They're having trouble sleeping, or they sleep all the time. Their appetites are absent or excessive. They are irritable, and their memories are shot. Often, they wish they were dead. They have trouble remembering what it is to be happy. That's called anhedonia. I listen to their stories. Each one is, of course, different. But there are certain recurrent themes. Others in their families have lived similarly discouraged lives. The relationships in similarly discouraged lives. That is such powerful writing. The relationships in which they now find themselves are either full of conflict or low temperature with little passion or intimacy. Their days are routine, unsatisfying jobs, few friends, lots of boredom. They feel cut off from the pleasures enjoyed by others. And that's what it means to be average. That is the average American these days. Here's what I tell them. The good news is that we have effective treatments for the symptoms of depression. The bad news is that medication will not make you happy. Happiness is not simply the absence of despair. It is an affirmative state in which our lives have both meaning and pleasure. It's so good. <laughs> I could never write like this. This is beautiful. It is an affirmative state. I affirm that I am happy. I declare that I am happy. It is an affirmative state in which our lives have both meaning and pleasure. Pleasure part's easy. And if you confuse that, you might end up hooked on drugs or alcohol. The meaning part, especially for someone who might be retired, past their prime, or older, they wonder like, what is the meaning of my life? I never, that's my problem, Dr. V. I never knew my purpose. So, medication alone is seldom enough. 
People also need to look at the way they are living with an eye to change. Got to look at the way they're living with an eye to change. We are always talking about what we want, what we intend. These are dreams and wishes and are of little value in changing our mood. We are not what we think. Here it is. This is the sentence that changed my life. We are not what we think or what we say or how we feel. We are what we do. Conversely, in judging other people, we are what we do. Conversely, in judging other people, we need to pay attention not to what they promise, but to how they behave. This is the classic action speak louder than words. This simple rule could prevent much of the pain and misunderstanding that affects human relationships. Isn't this what I tell you, Erica? Mm -hmm. Pay attention to what people do. When all is said and done, more is said than done. <laughs> Quote, when all is said and done, more is said than done. We are drowning in words, many of which turn out to be lies we tell ourselves or others. How many times do we have to feel betrayed, damn it, and surprised, damn it, at the disconnect between people's words and their actions? How many times are you going to fall for it before we learn to pay more attention to the latter than to the former? Pay more attention to their actions, y'all. Most of the heartbreak. Like if he tells you he loves you, but has a girl on the side, or wants to date other women, he doesn't love you. You know? If your children say, hey, I'm, I want to come home this weekend, and at the last minute they cancel... You're not a priority. Most of the heartbreak that life contains is a result of ignoring the reality that past behavior is the most reliable predictor of future behavior. What people have done in the past is what they're most likely to do in the future. What you, mofo, have done in the past is most likely what you're going to do in the future. So you're sad and lonely in the past, and in the past when you're sad and lonely, you tend to snack or binge eat. There's a very good chance if you're falling into sadness again, you are going to snack and overeat and binge eat. That's a good indicator. Woody Allen famously said that, quote, 80% of life is showing up. We demonstrate courage in the numberless way, small ways in which we meet our obligations or reach out to try the new things that might improve our lives. Many of us are afraid to risk and prefer the bland, the predictable, and the repetitive. This explains the overwhelming sense of boredom that is a de defining characteristic of our age. An overwhelming sense of boredom. The frantic attempts to overcome this ennui takes the form of a thirst for Ennui is like a French term. Like if you think about, um, if you think about like young starlets, you know, in movies, black and white movies, and they're all like, ah, that's, that's ennui. Like, oh, I don't know what to do. My life. You know, Charlotte Bronte, the Bronte sister books, that sort of stuff. Ennui. I lost mine. The frantic attempts to overcome this ennui take the form of a thirst for entertainment and stimulation that is, in the end, devoid of meaning. It's devoid of meaning. It is the answer to the question, why, that weighs most heavily upon us. Why are we here? Why do we choose the lives we do? Why bother? The despairing answer is contained in a popular bumper sticker. Whatever. Or I would say, YOLO. In general, we get not what we deserve, but what we expect. Ask a successful hitter in baseball about what he thinks will happen when he steps to the plate, and you will hear something like, I'm taking that thing downtown. If you point out that the best hitters in the game make an out two of three times they bat, any good player will say, yeah, but this is my time. The three components of happiness are something to do, write this down, three components of happiness are one, something to do, 
someone to love, and most importantly, something to look forward to. I'm flying on Thursday to uh, New Mexico. I'm trying to schedule a time to see this new piece of property. That is something to look forward to. And, and to see Aspen again. I wonder if she'll remember me. Think about it. If we have useful work, something to do, sustaining relationships, someone to love, and the promise of pleasure, something to look forward to, it is hard to be unhappy. I use the term work to encompass any activity, paid or unpaid, that gives us a feeling of personal significance. That's these lives this morning. It's the 30 of y'all who still show up, you know, three and a half years into this. It's without like reopening the tribe. It's crazy. That gives me a feeling of personal significance. If we have a compelling avocation that lends meaning to our lives, that is our work. It is a tribute to the diversity of human life that people can find pleasure and meaning in pursuing mediocrity on the golf course or at the bridge table. Think about the, or chessboard. Think about the traffic problems if we all liked the same things. Wow. You know. Much is made of the presumed difficulty in defining love because the basis for the feeling itself is mysterious. Why do I love this person and not someone else? It is assumed that words... Uh -oh. It is assumed that words cannot encompass what it means to love another. And, you know, that was uh, Ethan Hawke's phrase. No one cares about poetry until they attend a funeral. And they want to know if other people have felt as much pain as they have felt. So how about this definition? We love someone when the importance of his or her needs and desires rises to the level of our own. Wow. That's nice. Like Erica's needs and desires rise to the level of my own. That's really nice. In the best of cases, of course, our concern for the welfare of another exceeds or becomes indistinguishable from what we want for ourselves. And an operational question I use to help people determine if they really love someone is, would you take a bullet for this person? This may seem an extreme standard, since few of us are required to confront such a sacrifice, and none of us can say with certainty what we would do. If our desire for self-preservation collided with our love for another. But just imagining the situation can clarify the nature of our attachments. Just imagine, would I take a bullet for my husband? Would I take a bullet for my kids? Would you take a bullet for your dogs? Really? Really? Think about it. Really? Take a bullet. A bullet. The number of people we would consider sacrificing ourselves to save is very limited. Our children, certainly. Our spouse or other loved one, maybe. <laughs> maybe. But if we cannot contemplate this gift, how can we pretend that we love them? More commonly, feelings of love or the lack of it are noticeable in all the mundane ways we show that someone matters to us, especially in the mounting quality of the time we are willing to give them. Dude, it's all of these like little gifts and shit that we buy people and presents and surprises and we're just this little these little mundane ways we're trying to show them. When really, you know, the big question is, do their needs exceed your needs in, in terms of importance? The point is that love is demonstrated behaviorally. Love is an action verb, y'all. Once again, we define who we are and who and what we care about, not by what we promise but by what we do it goes back to that. You can't say you love somebody and you treat them badly. You just can't. You know, Eric and I had this discussion when we got pregnant with Mason. I'm like, dude, we're not spanking Mason. A big person exerting physical authority over a smaller person is not parenting. There are other ways to do, especially when there are other ways to parent. 
sometimes Eric and I and joke or like, boy, some days, man, I would really love to smack her, smack her in the butt, but we don't. Because that's not love, man. It's just not love. Once again, we define who we are and who and what we care about, not by what we promise, but by what we do. I constantly redirect people's attention to this. We are a verbal species, much given to the use of words to explain and deceive. The worst deceptions, of course, are those we practice on ourselves, y'all. What we choose to believe is closely related to deeply felt needs, for example. The dream we all carry around inside of us of perfect love, unqualified acceptance of the sort available only from a good mother. This desire makes us vulnerable to the worst forms of self-deception and disillusionment. An indulgence of the hope that we have at least found a person who would endlessly love us exactly as we are. Just love me as we are. What if you're not a good person? I don't have to love you. What if you don't hold your word, keep your word? What if you cheat on me? What if you abuse me? Why would I just love you? Because you have this problem. When, therefore, someone purports to do so and says the words we so long to hear, it is not surprising that we might choose to ignore incongruent behaviors. When I hear someone say he does inconsiderate things, but I know he loves me. See, I'm just talking about this. I usually ask if it is possible to intentionally hurt someone we love. Would we do such a thing to ourselves? Can we love the truck that runs us over? Uh, that is such a good line. Can we love the truck that runs us over? Mark Twain, one of my favorite quotes says, Forgive, forgiveness is the fragrance the flower sheds I'm sorry. Forgiveness is the fragrance the violet sheds on the heel that has crushed it. Can we love the truck that runs us over? The other thing that true love requires of us is the courage to become totally vulnerable to another. The risks are obvious. Who has not had their heart lacerated by a mistake in judging the person to whom we gave this trust? Such wounds are the basis for much of the cynicism about love that pervades our relationships and produces the competitive games that frustrate our efforts to have faith in each other. Dude, you've seen these couples play these silly games, try to manipulate, get one over on another, or relationships or siblings or formers or exes or whatever. They frustrate our efforts to have faith in each other. Often people, oh, we're almost done. Often people alternate between the extremes of loneliness and self-deception. See? Like, I, I would rather be with this person, this mean person, than be alone. Really? Somewhere in the middle lies our best chance at happiness. Finally, we are entitled to receive only that which we are prepared to give. You will only receive what you are prepared to give. This is why there's truth to the adage that we all get the marriage partners we deserve and why most of our dissatisfactions with others reflect limitations in ourselves. We are what we do. You cannot say you love somebody and treat them poorly. They do not love you if they treat you poorly. And you are under zero obligations to love them just because they are quote-unquote family. Quote-unquote my best friend from high school. You are under zero obligation to love them. Children? That's a different story. You brought them into this world, you have an obligation. Spouses? Maybe, he says. Maybe. Isn't that so good? What a good book. Six pages of wisdom. We started the morning with gratitude for our bodies and because without this body like we wouldn't have any place to live we would be done six feet under then we did our gratitude journaling and grateful and and try to show y'all like 
Remember, I am grateful and thankful for my loving, beautiful, thoughtful family and friends, whatever. Use these, these adjectives. They're very important. It's um, Carolyn Mize. Like, choose new words. Stop saying, like, I am so grateful and thankful for my broke down house. No, you're not. I'm so grateful and thankful I have a broke ass husband. No, you're not. You're lying and your subconscious knows and it blocks. You know, our, this is this is that cynicism he talks about in this chapter. We're being you're being too cynical for the for the attempts at humor. Why do we do that? It's because we like we we have that that icky feeling and we want to discharge it. So we, we don't want to feel this icky feeling. So if we like make a funny little joke or we are self-deprecating or we kind of like, eh, eh. no, I just like to twist it in my husband. Just eh, eh. Like, needle him a little bit. Like that's not love. And your subconscious knows. At the end of the day, no one cares about your spirituality, your Christianity, your Muslimism, your Buddhism, your how Christ-like you are. No one cares what you believe, what you think. We are what we do. Love is an action verb. You gotta show people you love them, right? You guys ready to go see JR? I'm taking JR the Cadillac to Portia Roberts today, so we gotta go. 1969, Cadillac DeVille. The exact same model and year that's in the Dukes of Hazzard's the Total Boss Hog car. And I got it with the Longhorns, which those Longhorns are probably 1500 bucks alone. You got the four quad headlights, ton of chrome, which is what we like to see, ton of chrome. And the previous owner said, I want this to be the gaudiest interior. It's got red alligator, red alligator seats, and white ostrich trim, and beautiful blue dash pad. So that interior is like pretty much perfect. Radio doesn't work, no air conditioning. Windshield wipers currently don't work. Garbage truck. In 69, and I think it started in 68. I could be wrong, it might be 67. They, they dropped the fins. But they still have prominent fins. I want those old school Cadillacs with the big fins. I had that license plate lying around, so I put it in there. Don't tell anybody. See that chrome? All that chrome? Beautiful. And these tires are actually new, Dina. These are new white wall tires. So this, I don't know if you can, if this will tell, but that's not polished. Yesterday, I polished this one with my chrome polish you see the difference can y'all see this is like spotless i polished this bumper with my chrome polisher so i love doing those little things i also polished this pillar my chrome buffer and also this trim along the window i mean it is shiny chrome uh it's got 427 cubic inch engine which was the largest motor made then and um, I think that alligator ostrich skin interior is at least eight grand to do. This Longhorn's 1500. So that really, I mean, say 10 grand in upgrades. And I got it for $22,000. And, um, and uh, Alan Taylor said, don't pay more than 15. You gotta get in the teens. But if you add these upgrades, I think I did good. I think 22 is a great, great value. You just gotta see this thing, man. It is so big. It's longer than my Suburban. My Suburban's right there. I'm just showing you all these cars because just to show you all, I really have all these cars. But look how long that dang thing is. It is ginormous. It is giant. I can't even get it all in the screen. <laughs> That's how big it is. So imagine cruising down this thing and the door is so stinking heavy to open and close. Look at that. Beautiful, right? So, all right. 